Hello and welcome to E5 Super Chat Catch-Up for episode 254, the one where we talked about art again with good old Solar Sands. Fun times. Uh, we're here to check out the messages you guys put in, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna answer them. It's gonna be great. Um, this is I think they got jumbled a little bit, so they might be a little bit out of order, but that's okay. We'll just uh, make sure we answer them all. Starting with thoughts on House Usher. I really enjoyed it. Me too. I really enjoyed it. I thought me that it was a, me a very four. good showing by Flanagan, and he does not botch the ending. Boy, no, heading he does into that not. La last episode, we were nervous. <laughs> we were like, "Oh no, please!" Yeah, spoiler-free assessment is the uh, characters are pretty on point. It's got some twists and turns. They lay a lot of groundwork for you to predict a lot of things that are probably going to happen. Really Stick great to... performances, as per usual, from Flanagan. <clears throat> yeah, decent bit of poetry in how the story unfolds. Uh, though, from what I have heard, uh, po po fanatics, po fans are not as happy as they could be. Um, I've heard more the Poe fans are upset than happy. That 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 would be the consensus, I think. Um, <clears throat> this was uh, not a huge surprise, being that Hill House fans were very upset by the haunting of Hill House. I can't remember what Turn of the Screw fans thought of Bly Manor, but that all I know is that Flanagan is kind of the answer to a hypothetical, which is, what if you ignore the source but also make a thing good? And uh, that's what you get. And, you know, it's, uh, this is, uh, I guess if you're really into Al Edgar Allan Poe's work, I don't know that that would be a reason to recommend this. It's more so just uh, an interesting story in and of itself. Yeah, You'll appreciate a lot of the references and nods, though, if you are an Edgar Allan yeah, Poe um, fan. You know, I have a limited knowledge, but even I was like, oh, it's the thing. Oh, it's yeah. that. I know that. Um... And, and and as far as I know, there are people who are familiar with this work that are more than happy with this, so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I love his work, and I'm very happy with this, so yeah. I'm one of those people. Uh, so, so I was going to say, that's probably as much as we would want to say without spoiling anything. Um, I recommend, and we rate it, you know, it fits in with the other three, I would say, pretty well, in terms of like, yep, that's a Mike Flanagan show that has all of his uh, regulars in it, that tells a story that's full of interesting things to say about human nature and it's got some spooks in there a good man does this you season think it was a very spooky show would you recommend it for people who just want their horror oh i don't know about that that's, that's, i don't know yeah. about that either i feel kind of like it had some spooky stuff here and there but it didn't it like it it didn't feel like a horror show it felt like it was this thing that's a step down from that in terms of its well, tone like it was by comparison yeah. to his other shows, it was more graphic. Yes. Oh yeah, this is this is the goriest of his uh, of the four. The goriest and the most titillating, I would say. Yes, uh, definitely had the most of that going on. So I guess it's probably safe to be like, you know, keep in mind, viewer who's wondering if it's scary, we would rate, you know, the sc well, I don't even know what we would rate it in terms of the scary, you know, top to bottom in terms of the the three shows. Right, Midnight Mass, mm. Hill House, and Bly. Um, we've mm -hmm. mostly stuck to the idea that they're complicated in terms of describing the scare factor, but that Mike doesn't do the whole, like, um, dare I say, like, insidious approach, or um, scary thing runs at you real fast and characters run around screaming and stuff. It's it, a lot more of a slow burn, usually, with all of his stuff. Mm -hmm. um, though, I mean, there's some overt stuff and some jump scares. Uh, you, you get you get your, uh, your drip feed of sort of expected horror from the show i just yeah um, it's um it, it's got its moments that's for sure yeah but it's not going to be thrills all the time you know a fast-paced never-ending stream of chilly spooky stuff Mm-hmm. but um yeah we recommend yes da 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 doxa wolf Lemming calling out React streamers. Oh, Lemino. Uh, Loki happened, and House of Usher was pretty good. Hell of a two weeks. Also, high rags. Hello. Yeah, Thinking look at that. the idea of a, a little Lemming making his video on React <laughs> YouTubers. I just don't appreciate them. I think they're stealing. That's what I think. <laughs> I work now hard every day. 
What are, lemmings eat nuts, right? Like nuts. I don't remember. Seeds. I assume so. Oh. They're they're rodents, so I guess they eat like yeah. grasses and nuts and probably just whatever they, they can kind of find. They wouldn't mind some cheese if they could get their hands on some. Oh mm. yeah. I'm I don't mind cheese if I can get my hands on it. Yeah, same. For your stuff. Uh Molly, play Max Payne 2. It's better than Soma. Hmm. I hear Max Payne 2 is really good. I've only played a lot of three. <laughs> I've, I've only played three. Max Payne 3 as well. That's and I would highly recommend Max Payne 3. I have yeah, only played so Max I... Payne 1 and a Ooh, lot of it. Okay. It was fun. Max, Payne... Game. Max Payne 3 is uh, a really cool game. I, uh, I, I'm particularly... Because, uh, I mean, you know, usually the story is the thing that people point to, right? And presentation. But, uh, like, in terms of its core gunplay, it's really, like, straightforward and really minimalistic, but it, it's solid. Yes, very skill-based. Very uh, cool, fun, yeah. very rewarding, I'd call it. It I feels really so. good to do really good in that game. Especially when you're playing on the harder difficulties. Oh, yes. I can't believe Sniper Wolf stalked Jack's films on Friday the 13th. Um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of a uh, crazy sort of development to that story, isn't it? Yeah, and I think nothing's happened yet, but uh, we'll see. Uh, I think she's lost some sponsors, but uh, as for anything from She YouTube, lost her flavor. Oh no. Yeah, it's probably like a, what's, what's the thing? G Fuel, G -fuel? or... Yeah. <laughs> like she just... lost her G Fuel flavor. It's one of those things where I could see someone being like, oh, so you're okay with canceling? And just be like, I can't believe that she's been able to get away with this. Like, in I any way, shape, or form. I can't believe she actually went to his house and posted a picture of it on Instagram. Absolutely nutcase That's behavior. Crazy. Anyway, <laughs> um, name the Star Wars show that people said it's going to be the best and now no one remembers it, so what was the point? Mueller, uh, it's Star that's Wars. Like all of them. Oh. So that's they've got, they've got the answer in brackets, but I was actually going to say, like, surely all of them apply to this. Uh, I mean, I'd no one talks about good. Kenobi or Boba Fett. Kenobi, no one really yeah. talks about Mandalorian. I'm thinking Kenobi most fits the bill. Yeah, I would probably go with that. Uh, the person who sent this put in brackets that it's Star Wars Visions. Um, I feel like it's... I, I don't know about... I, I, I mean, I, I don't hear people talk about Star Wars Visions. Um, but I don't know that that was one that was, like, massively hyped by a huge portion of... You know, compared to Kenobi, for instance. Yeah, um, and Boba Fett similarly felt like it was like, yep. people were talking it big when it was coming out, and then people jumped off that ship super Ooh, quick. It was about Boba Fett, and we like Boba Fett. So. Boba Fett is so cool. They got Tamura Morris, and he was um, Boba Fett. Boba Fett was considered clownish basically by the end of its run, whereas it took a little bit longer for Kenobi to have that uh, that kind of effect. Like by episode seven, people were not super happy with uh, Boba Fett. I remember that much. Yeah. Um, also, do a Wonka arc. We'll be in the Wonka arc. I mean, there uh, will be. Well, I guess you'd have the original, the uh, the the remake Tim Burton one, and the new Wonka movie that's coming With out. Timothy this year, Chalamet, right? Chalamet, right? He's triple uh, threat. So yeah, that's uh, three Wonkas. Hugh Grant is uh, he's playing uh, the Oompa Loompas. Yeah, he's playing all of them. Yeah, he's playing the Oompa Loompas. Oh, we're doing that. Mm. Um, all right, that was really beloved by everyone. Makes sense that they're doing that again. Yep. Uh, uh yeah. Well, so. What's Hugh Grant been up to these days? Ah, uh, he was in Dungeons and Dragons. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, he was. He was. He was pretty good at that. He was funny. Um, I mean, he's charming. He's a charming guy. He is. Yep. Happy birthday, Mola. Love your Fringles, Rags. You've grown on me. Can't wait for my vinyl threesome. Oh, yeah. I'm very excited to, you know, be getting those later. Mm. Thank you. Um, pause this till I'm caught up on episode 47. All right, fair All enough. All right, will do. <laughs> we'll pause. Uh, how you wrote everything after Saw 3, I wouldn't have either... I would have either, A, bring back Jiggy and say he's a vampire. Bring back um, Jiggy. Or B... <laughs> get Jiggy with it. Some well, might say. Their alternative is that he's an alien trying to understand humans. Oh, those are the writers. Yeah, I think so. Um, they get in there too. You know, give them time. Saw 15, I think, is where we'll maybe, we'll maybe crack it. 
Can you imagine Saw 15 being nominated for an Academy Award for Best Picture? No, I can't. <laughs> and you know how that you know how like the uh because at the Oscars they they have the uh, the uh the orchestra play the the music. Could you imagine the orchestra up there playing the Saw theme as imagine uh, whoever directing that film goes up to accept their award? Imagine it happened to be the. Uh, you know, Martin Scorsese was just watching some films that a uh, fateful night, and he just happens. He's just for whatever reason he sees Saw, and then he just gets into it so hard that he's like, "This has potential." And then he offers to direct <laughs> Saw Fifteen. I just said now it's Saw like Fifteen. A fanatical um Saw fan. Yeah, he's like, you almost cracked it so many times, and I just I want to give it that extra push, and. uh I would watch a Martin Scorsese Saw movie. Hell yeah. <laughs> Even if it was uh, three and a half hours? Ooh. You know, in pieces. <laughs> no. Maybe half and half. Oh, wow. Just no. Damn. I don't, uh, I don't know if that was... I know, it just That's a long time to watch a Saw movie. That is a long time. Uh, well, it's a long time to watch any movie, isn't it? That's yeah, how that's long true. Uh, a new yeah. movie is, right? What would you a rather? A Scorsese uh, or Tarantino Saw movie? Uh, I would rather the Tarantino Saw movie, I reckon. Yeah, I think same. <laughs> that just sounds really. I feel funny like it's more of a Tarantino, yeah, thing. It does feel like it suits him better. We watched the Diet Tarantino movie yesterday before, after you left, Fringy. Oh, a Diet? We don't have to talk. A di a a Diet Tarantino oh. film yesterday. Kind of, yeah, yeah. We don't we don't have to talk about it though, but we can if you okay. want. So anyway, it's Friday the 13th in October. I'm halfway through the latest Saw EFAP before I head to work at a local park. Who do I see at the park? Of course, it's Mr. Saw himself, Tobin Bell. Wow. Nice guy, IRL. Did you really see him? That's Wait, really cool. He's, <laughs> He's um, just at the park. I've been made aware. He's got a YouTube channel that he just posts random stuff to. He's, oh. like, he's like a normal human. He's not one of them celebrity humans, you know? Oh, that makes sense. He's not like a superstar, you know, but he's like recognizable. He's, yeah, he's, he's a superstar level. to Saw fans, but he's yeah. outside of that, you know, it's like, well, he's just, he's Tom Bell. There he goes. Look at him with his, uh, apparently he sings as well and oh. plays guitar and stuff. Does he do the voice when he sings? I hope so. Start spreading the news. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving today. If we hit that bullseye, the rest of the dominoes should fall like a house of cards. Checkmate. Filoni's thrown, <laughs> trying to sound smart and competent. Oh, is that from something? That sounds I like feel a like that's a Futurama joke. quote, but I'm not sure. It could be a that Zap Brannigan uh... thing. If we hit the bullseye, the rest of the dominoes oh, should fall yeah. like a house of cards. Checkmate. Good shit. <laughs> I really enjoy that. His other quote that people were using that uh, it would be great if Thrill to said it was uh, in the game of chess you could never allow your opponent to see your pieces. <laughs> <laughs> um, live on my birthday, Fringy, what's your favorite dinosaur? Uh, am I going to be boring and say T-Rex? I don't know, are you? Uh, I really like T-Rexes. I also really like uh, Brontosaurus. Why do you like Brontosaurus? I don't know, they seem like happy guys, you know? Do you think happy people are better than sad people? Uh, no, it's just that I, I like how, you know, dinosaurs always seem like a very sort of competitive, aggressive, it's like a very hostile kind of world, and then you got like big old Brontosaurus there just chilling and eating leaves. I don't know, they, they look like they're happy dinosaurs, they look very content. I think they're like, when, when the T-Rex rolls by, they're like, oh, here we go. I don't know if they're uh, like that. I think they're like, hello, Mr. T-Rex, you're not going to mess with me, because I'm a, I'm a big lad. But, uh, you know, I hope you're having a good day. Safe travels, Mr. Mr. T-Rex. Kind of like yeah. Ned Flanders to Homer sort of thing. It's like, he's, he's a... Yeah! Just trying to find the good, you know? Yeah, that might be a good way of putting it. Brontosaurus is like the Ned Flanders of dinosaurs. <laughs> They were called, uh, in the land before time, they were called Longnecks. They didn't actually use their real names. They had little, um, little, like, I guess, not kid names, but, like, the, the brontosauruses were Longnecks. Then you had the Triceratops were Trihorns, or Three Horns. They'd all have, like, different, like, designations that were kind of based oh. off of how they looked. Hmm. I mean, think about I... other dinosaurs. I do really like Velociraptors, but specifically... 
the ones in Jurassic Park are really cool, but I uh, I personally really like the feathered sort of uh, illustrations that uh, you know. Yeah, the feathery raptor kind of ones. Them. Yeah, yeah, I quite like those. Uh, your thoughts on Linguini suddenly having hyper dexterity when rollerblading? I would have liked a scene earlier showing him good at rollerblading. Was he? I feel like that's a kind of dexterity that wasn't ever mentioned before because he was actually shown to be rather dexterous throughout the movie when he was avoiding bumping into people and There's, moving around. You could argue, too, that the dexterousness is present, but something that he has trouble accessing confidently when... Uh, Con yeah, confidence yes, might have been a part of it. Because remember, he, when before he goes out, he says, we need someone to wait tables. Like, he knows his place, he knows his role and what he can do, and he goes out. He's being affirmative. And normally throughout the movie, he's kind of following along, not really making super big decisions. Even the reason that he was at the restaurant was because it was a letter from his uh, mother when she passed away. Mm. Uh, so it was more like he was following her wishes um, more than anything else. Um, it's like he's in his element. Um... Kind of, yeah. This is something he wants to do, he knows needs to be done, and it's for people that he you know cares about now. And he knows how to do it. It's like the difference between a super familiarity with a video game and you're doing all kinds of crazy things, and then you play a arguably easier game for the first time and you're like, whoop, whoop, yeah, whoop, oh, working out, oh god. Um, but as for any information previous that he uh, is able to rollerblade well, I thought there would have been, but maybe there isn't. I, remember. I don't remember any like explicit um, reference. I probably would have wanted to set that up. IMO, but um, I guess uh, still kind of works, you know? It's, uh, it's, it's a thing that he's good at that you maybe wouldn't have expected. Yep. That fits him with everything else. Uh, do you guys believe in heaven and hell? And if you do go to hell, do you care? Something to think about, lads. Um, <laughs> what a question. I don't, believe in, I don't believe in heaven or hell. I imagine hell would not be a pleasant place based off of the, the no, way it's described. Memes aside, um, obviously if I had to choose between the two, I probably would go with heaven if, if hell is going to be the way that I, you know, the worst case scenario actually, just consist, consistent torture, not being able to talk to people, different forms, like even going down to boredom all the way up to like, you know, what, making you watch horrible things happen to people you love or something. Like, if hell was that, it would be like, yeah, I obviously wouldn't yeah, want to go there. If the choice is between eternal suffering and torment of whatever kind, you know, and a, a an eternity of bliss, albeit a brainwashed one, i going to have to go with a brainwashed bliss one. Well, yeah, in heaven, assuming I'm still myself, I can make, you know, I can make something of that environment more so than I can hell, I think. Probably. Hopefully. But, um, it would be very, um, Matrixy to be in heaven. You'd be like, no, this is real. Wake up, sheeple. Uh, would you rather see ya in a non tismy place? Much, would much rather see ya in the non tismy place? Oh, are you saying you'd rather see us in heaven than hell? Thank you, I guess. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, but as as you may be aware, we're not we're not too into the whole heaven hell thing in terms of uh, thinking that's actually a, a thing. Um, so I guess if it is real, we're all heading there. I'll see you there, lads. Hooray! Stumbled yeah, on I'm a, a pretty good person. Yeah, but does it, wait? Is that how that works? Or do you have to believe in the in the stuff? Soteriology is the entire study of what the conditions of salvation are in Christianity. Uh, so it's it's oddly enough, it seems to be very hotly debated, <laughs> which you'd, you'd think it would be very clear. You'd, you'd want it to be. You'd think that it would be incredibly clear, but I guess it isn't really. <laughs> Just picture all of us in a like old folks' home near the end of our days. It's like, we're going to make it if it's true? And you're like, with a little calculator or something like, I don't know. <laughs> I guess we'll hope. As long as they have video games in hell, we should be okay. Stumbled on a two-hour YouTube video, which is a collection of Hassan-related clips from EFAB 147, 148, and 161. Do you consider this transformative enough, or is it content-stealing? Hi, Rags. I have to Hello. see it. I don't know. Yeah, can't tell by the description. Um, 
yeah, there's there's like an amount of stealing that can and does happen on the internet that's impossibly hard to police, or at least without becoming like pretty hawkish about it, um, which can have really bad effects. In some ways, I know that this is a sacrifice a lot of content creators think about, which is like I could go after people who re-upload or make quote-unquote compilations that really are just chopping out some things that they don't like and re-uploading. Like if someone did an hour of content A and then an hour of content B and then back to content A an hour later and someone just re-uploads that but chopping out the content B portion, it's like, is that really enough work for them to monetize all the work that you just did? And, and a lot of content creators will be like, well, I'll just let them. Because if I was to try and bring down that, which Hassan has talked about this actually, um, then you'll you'll have another negative effect of being seen as someone who doesn't allow like fans to you know, celebrate work or something, or then it can bleed into criticism or reaction and stuff. You kind of just end up leaving it alone. I guess what I'm saying is that whether or not it is stealing, a lot of people know that and they can get away with it because they rely on, like, the good faith and goodwill of uh, the creators in the first place. And that's not even to speak of other platforms where they actually just steal whole channels and re-upload. Which is crazy, by the way, but I don't know. I guess whatever makes a living. I think it was, um, could have been Jack's films, could have been someone else, but I remember uh, they brought down a channel that was uploading all their uh, videos, I think on TikTok, and they got a message from the person saying, uh, you got your bag, why can't you let me get mine? Which was uh, interesting, as a point of view. Also, hi, Rags. Hello to you. In response to reject modernity, embrace tradition meme, modern art guy just did the reverse reject tradition, embrace modernity meme. Uh, it was shallow and the bad faith argumentation just evaporated what little water in the puddle there was. Uh, I certainly thought it was shallow. Yeah. Uh, hello guys, I finished watching EFAB 90 and the bit where you guys joke about Wilford Brimley dead had me rolling on the floor laughing. Keep up the good work. Yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah. That was a fun meme episode. And that was a good meme, and then he died and ruined it. And then he died. He had to go and die. Oh. He just had to go and die. What a shame. As an alt writer myself, I believe people deserve less. Now excuse me as I exploit underpaid workers for fun. Wah ha 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 ha. Oh, oh that no. guy sounds cartoonishly He's villainous. a villain, yeah. You can tell by the way that he laughs at the suffering of others. What a bad man. What a foul human... Australia, what the fuck? The Kuwaka, they have large muscular cartilage reinforced butts. They crush their, crush their predator's skulls against the ground with said butts. I don't believe that. <laughs> yeah, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I think that you're making, I think you're, yeah, you're fibbing. Just, is this misinformation? Is this some, is this slander? Did someone do that? Just go on the internet and tell lies? Yeah, evidently. Well. Oh. I mean, I, I certainly couldn't confirm or deny, but it uh, sounds like it's an unpopular sentiment. And uh, Yeah. You know, we we got to look after that population. They, they wouldn't appreciate it if we just allowed that to go without any, you know, challenge. Have you guys played Iron Lung? No. I've not. I've heard it's very scary, though. I've heard they're making a movie that Markiplier's really? going to star in. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Very much so. Okay. I'm going to check that out when it comes out. I will be, see what they're up yeah, to. Yeah, I'm super, super curious to kind of see that. Either of you know what the game is? What do you do in Iron Lung? I don't... I've not heard of it. I don't know. Really don't know? know. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, I don't really know. I think it's similar... I think it's something about deep sea exploration looking for, like, uh, some treasure and there's monsters or something. I'm, I'm not exactly hmm. certain. I've only seen, like, screenshots here and there, and people say, yeah, Iron Lung's really scary. Well, the trailer, the teaser trailer for the movie version just had a guy covered in blood saying some spooky things, and I was like, I have no idea what this game is, but alright. Maybe it wasn't blood, who knows. Uh, do you guys watch House of Usher yet? I didn't know Edgar Allan Poe was so fascinated by lemons, the more you know. Oh, he is. He loves lemons. Boy, he's, he's really interested in lemons, as, sh as we all should be. Lemons are yummy. They had a delicious taste it's to like many meals. Role, you should be interested in lemons. I think so. Yeah, as generally, you should be interested in lemons. How many times per day? You know, we're talking about how many times a day men think of the Roman Empire. How many day times a day do you think someone ought to think of lemons? 
Oh, not as much I as mean, the Roman Empire. Two, but... it, yeah, um, well, I, we don't want it to take away well, from you know, the Roman let's Empire. Not... I, I, well, you know, look, there's sufficient time in the day to think about the Roman Empire and... Yeah, 24 hours. Lemon. Yeah, exactly. Well, at 16... Well, I guess we include dreams. Uh, dream time, which I suppose that counts, right? Absolutely. If you, if you think about the... If you don't think about the Roman Empire during the day, but you, you know, dream about them at night, then I think I'd say that counts. If you're dreaming about, about it, is that you thinking about it, or is that your brain uh, taking you on an adventure, or...? I think it has well, to be thinking I mean, about I it, right? I feel like we... Uh, any any it line that we try to draw between, I guess, a thought... It depends on how conscious we believe, you know, thoughts... Where do thoughts arise from, you know? Do, do thoughts... Do you think them or do they arise and then you notice them? You know, there's a mm. lot of debates about that. And I feel like the more we try to draw lines between what constitutes thinking when at the end of the day, if it's all happening in your brain. Yeah, I don't know about that. So, yeah, I think if you dream about it, then you're thinking about it. All right. Um, Bob Ross was a serial cheater. Damn. I did not know that, if that's true. I saw another He's comment talking about... He's just trying to spread out his love and his affection throughout the world. I saw another comment talking about how he'd stolen the show from his mentor or something and that the person really didn't like Bob Ross and that people should know more about him. I was like, oh no, is this are we doing the thing where the good person turns out to be evil or something? I don't know any of this information that's why I, uh, I, I cannot confirm or deny. Um, hi Longs, Rags and Frings. Hello. Hello hey. to you. Where do you draw the line between an anti-hero and an anti-villain? How would you describe just define each? So, an as far as I'm aware, an anti-hero, an anti-villain, as a definition, depends on whether they're the protagonist or the antagonist of the story. So, the anti-hero is like the POV character, the main character, whereas the anti-villain is the antagonist, and that them being anti is then derived from you know whatever their traits are. I thought we were That's how I understand um... it. Let I thought anti-hero was, uh, they do, like, they achieve the heroic stuff, and they have an interest in it, but they're willing to do dubious actions. I I'm not sure, because I, I feel like I've definitely seen characters classed as anti-heroes who were doing things that weren't, like, good. Um, well, that's the but, idea, isn't but, it? Yeah. Well, no, 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 that, that, because it seems like what you're saying is their goals are good, but their methods are bad, as, like, the anti-hero thing, or... Essentially? Like, what, or at least think? controversial. Uh, and so then the anti-villain like would be that their, their goals are... Um, well, Punisher would be a pretty archetypal anti-hero, but I mean... Well, so, like, for instance, you know, is Walt an anti-hero, or is he the, just the villain, essentially? I think he goes from anti-hero to villain. Um, so you'd say by the end that he would be considered the villain of the story. Certainly when he organizes the deaths of those people in the prison. That, that I feel like, is peak Walt villain, that, that area of uh, Breaking Bad. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, because of course, like, Breaking Bad's often been said to be essentially the story of the villain, but I wonder if that's how, you know, the way that these terms are typically used, that he would be characterized. Because um, like I said, my understanding was that the anti-villain is typically not the POV character. They are still, like, the opposing force to the protagonist, but, you know, they've got, like, noble qualities or noble traits or, you know, go about their... their, their uh, bad goals in a in a noble way. So I'm looking up. Um, I've gone to TVTropes.org. I found it very useful over the years. Yeah, yeah, um, I think it's a useful resource. Antiheroes are to them described as a protagonist who has typically the opposite of most of the traditional attributes of a hero. They may be bewildered, ineffectual, deluded, or merely apathetic. More often, an antihero is just an amoral misfit. While well, heroes are typically conventional, anti-heroes, depending on the circumstances, may be pre-conventional in a quote-unquote good society, post-conventional if the government is quote-unquote evil, or even themselves unconventional. Um, right, so that sounds like, because it's described them as the protagonist. So yes. So I think that um, means that off, if we well, operate by that definition, then that sounds, it sounds like a kind of... I don't think they need to be the protagonist. I was going to say, I don't um, agree with the definition anyway. I don't agree. I don't agree with uh, them needing to be a protagonist. Um, um, but what's interesting here is that their little, I guess their little flavor quote under the page is actually one, uh, I haven't seen this name in a while, but uh, they reference Salvor Hardin in Isaac Asimov's Foundation from 1951, an amazing book. 
Uh, the quote is, Tales without end are told of these massive, lonely figures who bore half seriously, half mockingly, a motto adopted from one of Salver Hardin's epigrams. Never let your sense of morals prevent you from doing what is right. That sounds like a kind of anti-hero-ish kind of line. Sure. The... Uh... So, so if if we were gonna if if we're gonna base if we went by a definition that wasn't based on essentially what role they're designated in the story, would what? So w would we say that I... it would then be based on essentially their goals and motives and like the inverse, right? The anti-villain has what bad goals but goes about it in anti-villains are kind of. Maybe what well, I would I can... use for that would be uh you know um Anastasia the little I forget his name is it Bartok. Or talk the bat. Yeah, he's like he seems chill, and he's got like he's he's I guess he's up with the villain's plan for the most part, but not really doing much to add to it, and that simultaneously wants nice things for lots of people in theory, but doesn't. He's like he's like closer to it. Well, There's a couple of characters like that. Yeah, he's the... like an anti-villain. Then that's the yeah, that's kind of how I write that. The description they give for anti-villain is pretty short. Um, the anti-villain okay. is the opposite of an anti-hero, a character with heroic goals, personality traits, and or virtues, who is ultimately the villain. Their desired ends are mostly good, but their means of getting there range from evil to undesirable. Alternatively, their goals may be selfish or have long-term consequences they don't care about, but they're good people who might even team up with a hero if their goals don't conflict. Hmm, that's, okay. I still don't know if I find that as useful as the What's one... Hard? Because uh, that that uh, feels like it's describing Walter White almost. Th what that he would be considered an anti-villain? Possibly. Would that be an Would that be an issue if he was considered an anti-villain? Uh, you think that sort of I think shifts the maybe like, the way we look at the terms in a bad anti way? Anti-villain kind of implies a level of like they're not as bad, and you know by the end of the story, Walt is uh he's doing some pretty vile things. Well, I was gonna say like, regularly. You know, depending on where in the timeline you are, he could just be straight up villain. Like there's not much. Yeah. Yeah, like especially towards the end, he's getting particularly ruthless um and callous. So like to describe him as an anti villain seems like not quite right. Cause it feels uh, I Hmm. Yeah. Um So well cause cause I guess uh now I'm just trying to figure out like uh I'm I'm just thinking about other examples where I'd think of maybe saying, hmm, I guess they're like an anti villain. Uh, hmm. you know, you got um an anti-villain's goals may be selfish or have long-term consequences they don't care about, but they're good people who might even team up with the hero if their goals don't conflict. That actually feels like as a description that you could fit Punisher in there, and I've not heard anyone say Punisher's an anti-villain. No, Punisher is all. But again, I feel like that stems from the fact that Punisher is like the POV character. He's the protagonist, so that's why he's an anti. He's the anti-hero. That feels weird to but me that we again, base it around protagonist status or not because uh, well i mean i i guess uh i i imagine that the reason why that's the case is because it's just pretty rare that you would have a story where like the antagonistic forces is, is like the hero essentially that that's, that's oh it's, sure right? i just mean that we rare. call lots of characters heroes when they're not the main character you know what i mean and the, yeah no I, I i get you low from that i was actually gonna say um there's a couple of examples i guess like you know like boromir he's like one of the most easily encapsulated heroes and it'd just be like yeah but he's not a main or something if someone was to say he's um, not a protagonist i'd be like that's weird well i guess uh i guess the thing is is that it's it's a uh, protagonist as i understand it protagonist <clears throat> just means that they're the the main character it doesn't it's say anything about story, sort of yeah it, um... like it, it, the protagonist is the main character and the antagonist is the opposing force yeah it's just that generally the protagonist is the hero and the antagonist is a villain. The problem is that, like, villain is a, is a, is a strong word. Um, you, know, you can often have people who are opposing forces who aren't, like, a villain. They're just, you know, an opposing yeah, force I mean, in the story. Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, has, like, one, two, well, three, that, that'd be an four, interesting one to talk yeah. about, right? five like, antagonists. If, if like, uh, you know, Goldilocks isn't a villain. Um, she's yeah. an opposing Goldilocks force. She's bears. an antagonistic force, but they're not the villains. The villain... Yeah. And villain even death, Jack. right? It's like yeah, I wouldn't say death is the not one. the villain, but yeah, Jack Horner is easily the, the villain. Time, Jack is is the villain. Um, so may maybe maybe death would be considered like an anti-villain in the sense that 
well, you know, the fact that he has some kind of code that binds him. We brought up uh, yeah. Breaking Bad. I was actually going to say, I feel like uh, Mike Ehrmantraut kind of counts as an anti-villain. <clears throat> he seems uh, like a very much a good man, but the... Oh, that's an interesting one, yeah, because he is an opposing force to Walt. And um, he's uh, he, and yet... his ends reach really bad things for a lot of people that he doesn't necessarily care about. That's true, Because yeah. he's doing it for his daughter sort of thing. Uh, well, so would you say that, like, Saul in Better Call Saul is more of an anti-hero? Well, you guys talk about that. I need to do something real quick, and I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. Um, that's the, the, this is where it gets real complicated because that's like six seasons of actions, right. and I'd have to think about timeline again in terms of which who we're choosing at what time. Um, well, you know what? Here's an interesting question because everybody accepts Punisher as an anti-hero. Daredevil is kind of an interesting one where you could consider him an anti-hero, depending. What about uh, what about old Batman? I feel like those are on a sliding scale and that that is actually how it slid. It went from uh, Punisher to Daredevil to Batman. Batman? Uh, well, I think it depends on uh, the interp the iteration of Batman as well, right? If you'd consider him an anti-hero. That's also true, yeah. We need to know which uh, Batman we're dealing with. Is he a Batman motivated well, by, you know, he enjoys beating the fuck out of people? Like, you know, like Daredevil's got that aspect. Uh, um, yeah, it's, well, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting, right? Does a hero who has darker elements to their personality... I, I, I'm almost, I'm not sure if that's, like, enough to make them what people would typically consider an anti-hero, because, I mean, you know, typically the hero's got some kind of journey that they got. Like, Black Widow, for instance, she wouldn't be described as an anti-hero, despite the fact that, you know, she's got aspects of her past that uh, she not the um, with. Not the MCU one. No, uh, yeah, 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 referring to the MCU one. Um, well, I mean, I guess Loki probably turned into something of an anti-villain towards the end. Right? Wouldn't he be anti-hero by the time? It, it, uh, where where guess, are you choosing? What film? Hmm, I'm trying to think, because obviously in Loki he's the villain, in Avengers he's the villain. So it'd probably be between, like, Thor, the Dark... Like, in Ragnarok it feels like he's kind of... Uh, he's probably anti-hero by that point, I'd say. Maybe there was no phase when he was the anti-villain. He went from villain to anti-hero really, no. hero by the end, essentially. I, I feel like anti-villains are just pretty rare, honestly, compared to... It feels like anti-hero is a pretty popular archetype, whereas uh, anti-villains mm -hmm. are a little bit more difficult to find. It's making me think, though, because all it's making me think about is... Uh, I'm not sure how exactly to draw the line on which is which, is which and, and how, they, how we arrive at them. Yeah. Mm. Uh... Sola Sans, Sola Sans, the S S S coincidence. I mean, you know, a lot of people can preview it by S S. Uh, Solid Snake, for example. He's mm. uh, and he's pretty cool. Muller, I beseech you, play Armored Core. Um, I don't know. I'm just not that sold on it. Um, some people say it's really cool, but that's about it. And uh, I've seen the gameplay, and I get it. Like, you're a mech, and you have lots of cool, you know, guns and stuff, and you fight other mechs, so I was just like, I don't know, though, I'm just not, not something that's grabbing me. You know how something can grab you by the soul? Not being grabbed by it. Uh, Fringy, I beseech you, play Mad Rat. Mad Rat Dead? I haven't heard of that. Neither have I. No clue what that is. Um, and they've got one for rags, we'll wait till he's back. A molds on the topic of art slash games was wondering if any of you massives have encountered a game in recent memory that made you feel like they wasted what video games can offer as a medium. Oh, so oh, many, boy. Oh, so geez. many. <laughs> All right. So typically, the kinds of games when you ask that question, the kind of games that come to my mind first and foremost are games that give you um, either give you a choice that should be meaningful but isn't. It's like a fake choice, or Something really should be a choice that you can make and should make, but it just it's kind of you're you're super on rails and um and you you aren't able to really make any choice. I think those are the uh, among the strongest elements of that media is being able to make narrative choices because you are a part of the story. May often I suggest, in a big way because you're the protagonist. Well, that uh, the example would be Resident Evil Seven, where you uh, have to choose between taking. Oh Nia. yes, fuck. Take Mia or the other girl to safety, and uh, if you choose either of them, uh, essentially a slightly different cutscene plays. Where it's so funny too. One, you get, your boat gets attacked by a swamp monster, and um, you wake up as Mia because she's 
you know, uh, fall into the water and then, I guess, beaches somewhere. Um, you play as her for a bit. If you choose the other girl, because the same cutscene plays, and then you wake up as Mia on the beach, and it's like, what? How did this happen? It's like, it just, it, she also was in the water or something, I don't know, shut up. Like, okay. Um, yeah. This, I, so that's interesting, but I'm, I'm guessing that, because my thinking with the question is like, a game that has a story that is betrayed by the type of game that it actually is. Well, there's going to be countless examples. I assume that was just one from Rags. The first thing that came yeah, to my mind a, was a general um, sphere of Bioshock Infinite. Game. Like, that yes. was what I was thinking as well. Just um, lacking. Bioshock Infinite should not be... It probably it shouldn't really be a first-person shooter game. There's I, feel a lot like of, I would say that just generally, a TV show. this question been is a going stealth to apply game. to games oh, that that too. either first- or third-person shooters. That that is because that's the most popular genre. A lot of games end up being in that genre, even though the story that they were telling really should have been, you know, serviced by a different uh, gameplay loop. So yeah, Bioshock Infinite's a pretty, uh, pretty pitch perfect example of that. Then there's stuff like Lord of Ring Golem, which is just terrible. Which uh, yeah, just didn't need to exist as uh, anything really. <laughs> no, they could have just scrapped that, but they didn't. To this day, I will be um, really, really sad because um, these people have no actual balls. Uh, Druckmann should have had it in The Last of Us 2 <laughs> that they should have publicized, because they know, they know, um, oh, I bet they knew that they could find out, right? How many people spared Abby by the end, or how many people killed her at the end? Actually give you a choice, you know? I think that you have, a, you, you have no balls to not allow the player to make that decision. Um, especially if you had any level of confidence in what idea you were trying to get across. Yeah. Um, it's, that's the kind of game that just makes you wonder. It's like, why are you making video games exactly? Like, why, why, why are you in this industry? Because it just seems like you're foregoing an opportunity to leverage the medium for what it has to offer that films can't do, films and TV shows. Um, you just kind of had your story, you wanted to tell it, and even though it made for a really interesting choice, like that would have been a really interesting choice, especially given, you know, what they thought their game was about. But uh, no, nah, well, you know, it's our story, you know, it's yep. ours. I um, I don't really know too much about cost and numbers and things of that nature, but I'm curious if they wanted to make a show like you know, The Last of Us or whatever, but they wanted to wanted to do it entirely as like a like a cutscene in game graphics that sort of thing but make mm. a show like that because we're getting to the point where they look really fucking good now so i don't think you'd really get that many complaints from a lot of people would that cost more or less than shooting a show of like the last of us's quality in live action uh well i mean i think we have some kind of frame of reference right the last of us show cost something like 100 million dollars to make didn't it uh that's a good question i'm not sure but i think so I think it was something like that. Um, it sure looked expensive in, in a good and way. And I would be very surprised if The Last of Us wasn't a six-figure uh, game in terms of its budget. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, fig I figured that it would just be a matter of, like... that. It's got to be expensive, right? If you wanted to do, like, a fully, like, CG... TV show for like nine episodes, you know, nine hours worth of story. That's got to be expensive, right? Undoubtedly, yeah. Video game graphics, it, like, I'm uh, because you know, video game graphics still aren't on the same level as the kind of things that can be accomplished with pre-rendered. <clears throat> um, True. Yes. And, e and e I, even I, then, I think you know, going stylized is kind of the the arcane route or something similar. Absolutely. Going stylized is the way to go. Yeah. Because we're getting to the point where you might start confusing my brain, and I get that little, that little, that little voice in my head that's like, "This isn't real," and I'm like, "I know that. Why are you telling me this, me?" Um, the thing is, though, is that like, what can be accomplished now? Like some of the pre-rendered trailers for video games, it's insane. Um, like the 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 pre-rendered trailers I did for Cyberpunk were crazy. Like in terms of how lifelike it looked. Yeah. Rags, I beseech you, play with my boy hole. Hi, Rags. Hi. I will do no such thing. Mm -hmm. I will do no such thing. Hey, EFAP is on. Hashtag lemon. Hey, yo. Alrighty. Uh, you call this a cheeseburger? They used to put cum in between the patties. It's something called customer service. That's what you used to get. Not anymore. Everything's cheap. That's a quote, apparently. 
I don't think they used to put cum in the burgers. Well, I mean, you know. The, that was back in the day when they had Coke in the Coke. <laughs> Maybe. And cum in the burgers. And cum in the burgers. Your thoughts on Linguini... Oh, wait, that's, I read that already. Uh, farewell and adieu to you, fair Flemish massives. Farewell and adieu to you, massives of Fleem. This is the gay Michael Douglas, I think, uh, stuff. I always, I feel oh, like they open okay. with that. Hello, I'm gay actor Michael Douglas, and my favorite Curious. class of Mass Effect is the Sentinel. Warp and Overload, your favorite? Um, I either like Soldier or Adept. I like to go full combat, or I like to go full biotics. Hmm. I think, uh... Uh, I like Adept as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. There's something neat about being able to have, like, the full list of biotic powers and being able to use them. <clears throat> neat. With all this talk of art, I've decided to take my own work to the next level, both my art and my writing, to make the best manga I can possibly produce. I hope to show you all one day. Oh, well, best of luck. I hope it ends <clears throat> yeah. up really good. Neaterino, good luck. Are any of you lads a fan of Harvey Birdman? I've not watched Attorney it. at Law? I presume I they're talking about that. Um, I've seen clips, and I've liked the clips I've seen. The old I have not seen. Show. It's like Space Ghost. Uh, thoughts on the Northman and its EFAP when? High ranks. Oh, I haven't seen the Northman. First off, hello. That was one uh, we need to secondly, watch at some point. I would like to watch the Northman. Feel like it kind of slipped slipped through the cracks or something. Mm -hmm. But I would like to like to give it a look. I, I'm I'm definitely interested. I want to take a look. Um, I think EFAP's YouTube shorts could work very well with edited down but concise visions of good arguments slash moments from the pod. I think that's a pretty good idea. Well, then I gotta get someone to do it, don't I? I can't do that too. You can't have the long yeah. man making shorts. That's some kind of against the law. He's got or a reputation to keep. Yeah. But um, I agree, that probably could work. Shadow the Edgehog is a good design. Or has a good design. Um, um, I mean, it's okay. I don't really have an opinion on it in terms of like the quality of the design. It's, it's Sonic, but he's black and red. It has a gun. Well, the thing is, is that I like uh, classic Sonic's design a lot. Um, newer Sonic is okay. It's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do design points work if it's a sort of like a recolor of something else that's well designed? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, how do we feel about Mario and Luigi? Do we feel like Luigi loses points because he's a you know a variation of Mario's uh, look? I think you would be able to say that with the originals, but with a look now, I think the the design is very distinct. You know, uh, I'd say that they're. Well, sure, I, I, but, but I imagine, I imagine the argument would be made is like, yeah, but, you know, Shadow's got his, his boots are a little bit different, and his, uh, what are, what are they called, like, the things Demeanor? on the back of their heads, the, they're, they're kind of like shaped little, yeah, quills, I guess, they're kind of like I guess a, a I guess a hedgehog would have quills. Yeah, they're shaped a little bit differently, so, you know, they don't, they don't look exact, and their eyes are kind of, they're, they're shaped a little bit differently. They're very Shadow big. Look like he's in a bit more of a permanent sort of, uh scowl so you know there, there are differences there we're in the same way that mario and luigi you know, look different oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well i didn't name that they had different shoes and colors of thing and maybe like bigger or smaller hands it was like the whole face is different that's good yeah but yeah sonic and shadow they kind of have similar looking faces too that's what i'm saying i said the opposite of that what they don't Sonic's have similar that? looking faces Mario and Luigi do? do not have similar looking faces. Um, um no. they look similar, but they're similar -ish. Definitely different. You could like then they look like their brothers. For instance, I have a similar face to my mother. I look sort of like my mom, but we're obviously not similar. So it depends where you draw the line well, of what is I, and isn't. I, I, oh, similar. by the way, I mean, you know, besides the memes, yes, I believe that they have done a better job of making Luigi look different from Mario than they have for Shadow. Mario, like Luigi, is taller. He's skinnier. Um, yeah, like, it's, it, it, he looks different. But, uh, yeah, I, I've never really stared at the difference between Shadow and Sonic. Maybe it's really noticeable outside of the color, um, but... 
I would imagine he's more that if pointed. Shadow is blue, that's that's basically the main difference. He's got sharper features, I guess you could say. Um, but and I guess something that helps Mario as well is that not everybody looks like Mario or Luigi, you know. <laughs> like th there's there's pretty dramatic different. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, they. they... <laughs> When you it's put them very side by clearly that it's it's on the template. It's on the Sonic OC template right, that you just the, do. Yeah, whereas with a Max, yeah, if there was a line between these two approaches, uh, I feel like Sonic and Shadow are underneath the line, and Mario and Luigi are over the line in terms of. And again, I think you know, I agree. It, it helps that there, I, I which is you know, I guess you could make the case that there is sort of a consistency in the way that Sonic characters look. But I believe that the consistency also holds true for the Mario art style. And, you know, like, the difference between Mario and Wario and Waluigi and, like, Donkey Kong and Yoshi, you know, is different than the difference between, you know, Sonic and Tails and Knuckles and Amy and Shadow. There's a, uh, there's a certain consistency that carries through. Which, you know... It's not necessarily a bad thing. This uh, this showed up in Google Images, I guess, from DeviantArt, which is kind of funny. Uh, uh -oh. I, I think that the images are just way too similar. You know, like the this art style, they basically just recolored them all. Okay. Damn, <laughs> Luigi is being sassy. Look at him. <laughs> Wario's very skinny. He's very thin. He's lost he's, quite uh, a bit of weight. weight. Yeah, he did he's a keto diet. Look he's at him lost go. a lot of weight. I like how Wario. He's just. He's just really greedy, you know? He's a greedy guy. He likes his money. Mm-hmm. And I wonder when they're going to do another uh, Wario. Like, not, not the WarioWare games, but the, you know, like, Wario adventure platformer games. Out of curiosity, you've said it too many times for me not to think about it now. Isn't it Wario? Isn't that what he says? Uh, well, sure, but I mean, you know, Yoshi says Yoshi, and people fight over Yoshi or Yoshi. How do you settle it? Uh, I've always called him Wario, even though, you know, he says Wario. Ah, you know, like, I've always I said I don't say Wario. it enough to know how I pronounce it. And I, I, to me, it's interesting because I, again, I don't call him Waluigi. It's, I just say Waluigi. That's what I say. Um, so I'm not sure. Uh, which is kind of interesting because I, <laughs> I've, uh, well, the thing is, is that I can accept people saying Yoshi. But people usually fight me when I say Yoshi, which I find bizarre. Oh, they do. Cause... I continue to say Yoshi, though. I say uh, well, Mario, Wario, Waluigi, Luigi, uh, Yoshi. Well, so as I understand it, Mario and Mario is just an accent thing. I, and I think it... I, and I'm pretty sure it is Mario. I, I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. It's Mario. Yeah, yeah. Mario. In the same way, Wario, not Wario. Yeah, yeah. Which you know, yeah, that's uh, it follows. I've always just said Wario for some reason. I don't think I'm the only one either. I'm sure I've heard yeah, yeah, other I'm people sure. say Wario. Have um, you ever played the the indie game Wireframe? <laughs> what about uh, Gears of Wire? Gears of Wire. God of Wire. God of Wire. <laughs> God of Wire. War, war, God of wire. Hammer. Wire Warhammer 40k. Total wire. Total wire. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Halo wires. Halo wires. <laughs> ah, Halo wars. I have fond memories of that game. Never played the second yeah. one though. Uh I played a bit of the second one. It's uh I mean I liked it, but obviously it didn't. I hear that uh Halo's gotten better, by the way, Halo Infinite. Um that's, that's what I've better. heard. The new updates have made it a better game. That there's different leadership now at at, at uh, three four three. <laughs> but man, I'm very just, glad to hear that. Just in I'm time. Too. Um, yeah, that's like a the heroes enter the building and you know stop the evil from killing all the innocent civilians, oh, and they find that everyone's already dead. <laughs> like, we did it? We or, saved the town. We did it. Kind of moment. I was thinking about um, what was it the one uh, uh, in the Simpsons where the, the guy with the funny voice? I think you're off the hook. <laughs> I don't remember. Do you remember that? Oh, uh, it was you. You remember the? It was the. Do you remember the guy who where it was like all in favor? I all oppose. Nay. Who <laughs> keeps saying that? <laughs> and then he points to the buff guy. It was him. Let's get him, fellas. <laughs> and then he's just grinning like evil. <laughs> this evil grin as they beat him up. 
I don't know why, but that's reminded me of Mr. Snrub. I love that fucking joke. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mr. Snrub. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Mr. Burns. I like to... <laughs> what was it? I like to... What was it? It was he was at the bank, right? Yeah, it was like I I would like to not or push. It's something to do with some check or whatever. That's like yeah. okay, Mister Burnson, what's your first name? I don't know. <laughs> do, you remember, don't... do you remember the one where uh, Do you remember the one where Bot played the prank in the bank? What do you mean the bank is out of money? Insolvent? You only have enough cash for the next three customers, and then they all just stop like yeah. trying to get their money. And I was like, I don't I don't have your money. It's it's in Bill's house and, and Fred's house. Hey, what the hell are you doing with my money, Fred? <laughs> just it's Mo, right? Him. He punches him. Yeah, Mo just punches him. He just accepts that the money is in <laughs> Fred's house. <laughs> um, I'm predicting Saw 6 slash X is your faves. You predict correct. Oh. Did you yeah. predict uh, you have a very good prediction, but those seem to clearly stand above the rest for the most and part. One. And one. Yeah, one yeah. is the because the reason why we would have to say that is because you go you go six, ten, one, and then a big gap. Yes. There yeah. is a marked difference between those three films and all of the other ones. It's like the first two final destinations. Uh I'd say the first one. I'm I i do not want to put two in that category. I uh fair. I, totally I, fair. I'm a I'm I'm a I'm a pretty big fan of the first one, and I like the series overall. But as I we concluded, the second one's big plus was the physical effects. It wasn't like character uh, yeah. work, really. Oh, and 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 uh, five was kind of interesting. It was yes. three and four were really four was the worst. Oh yeah. Um, whereas you five the characters. Kind of, uh, I remember. Yeah, they, I remember that. I remember the characters the, somewhat. Specifically, the character names is kind of where I'm going with this. Nope. Oh, I, I, no, I so, can't remember the name. There was racist, racist's wife, oh. Milf, <laughs> and Milf's <laughs> husband. <laughs> yeah. It was funny as hell. That was the character remember names. How, like, one of the guys just got run over, and that was just it for him. They were just crossing the street and he got hit by an ambulance. Uh, what was that? <laughs> yeah, the, that well, was the like problem the with that was out. that he was, a, he was a big old main character to an extent. Like, he was the and guy... Like, yeah. I really mean, because like to be fair, that happens in the first Final Destination. It's one of the first kills. It does, it? but that was really early on. Whereas he was like part of the adventure, essentially. Yeah. I think the really awkward part was that the first one really wanted to lean into the mystery. The second one wanted to do it as well. Uh, and then by the time they were at four, it was like most of the characters basically disregarded it all. Um, it was just an excuse to essentially get the deaths, but they didn't really care about the uncovering the mystery or you know trying in any way shape or form to avert the catastrophe mm -hmm. um i think it was a bush viper fringy uh, oh yeah i remember reading that out the uh oh yeah yeah snack. yeah we, we uh that's right the snack uh, a good double feature is capitalism a love story and saw six i see because saw six regards health insurance and capitalism right. But I mean, uh, well, yes, I guess so. Um, hi, I'm gay actor Michael Douglas. I recently bought hi. a warehouse to store all of my copies of my beloved Sonic 06. Aw. Oh, that's a lot of copies. I think he used the money really from Quantumania to get that warehouse. That's pretty cool. Ooh, that's true. Mm, He's probably got a big chunk of change from that movie. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, yeah, he would have gotten paid. That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's Marvel who didn't get the money. <laughs> Uh, even had some homeless break in to escape the cold. They immediately left once they saw Sonic's stupid face everywhere. Uh, well, even homeless people, even even homeless crackheads have their have they their have limits. their limits. Yeah. That was uh, that was in the era because the the big thing with Sonic 06 was they were trying to take themselves more seriously. Mm -hmm. Doctor Eggman looked more like a normal person. Sonic was taller. Everybody was taller. They had that princess. And then they had, yeah. <laughs> they had that princess. <laughs> yep. And then they had Silver the Hedgehog, remember? And he was from the future. Ooh. And uh, he, everything's wasn't silver. It, wasn't it like that Sonic or something was like some big evil? Or like unleashed some big evil or something in the future? I don't remember. I have, n look, Frankie, I'm going to be honest. I have <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. Sanic. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a confusing. I mean, it's really a multifaceted 
mature, nuanced uh, story that they told in Sonic. Undoubtedly, yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it I liked it new more. In, I liked it more in Sonic Generations. How it was like, oh man, we're just like traveling through time. That's crazy, huh? <laughs> Let's stop Eggman. Feel like the honesty, that, uh... you know, you appreciate it. Yeah, or just you know the old ones where there was basically no story at all. It was just go save the animals and stop Eggman. I assumed it was a just this is as some sort of a ring addiction. Hmm. Showed my family Puss in Boots the Last Wish last night. By the end, no one had laughed once. Two of them were asleep, and a few went to watch more Loki afterwards. Feels bad. Man. Oh fuck! You're off. memeing, right? That's a meme. That's got to be a meme. Weird that. It would find that boring, and that Loki... I mean, even the art style alone in Puss in Boots, you'd think, would keep someone yeah. engaged, but... Okay. It's not a very long movie, either. No. So, hence why I'm I'm almost convinced that's a meme. Um, I looked up Fringy in an old book, and it reads, Fringy is a wholesome plague doctor from Redacted. He specializes in the story of... the study of his own mysterious goo. He likes going on little adventures and dislikes gay actor Michael Douglas. Oh. Does he? I like going on my little adventures. Yeah, I suppose I do. I like a little adventure every now and then. Well, you didn't deny it, Rags, so I guess so. Um, well, I mean, I like, yeah, I like, I like Michael, I, I like, uh, Wall Street. That's a, that's a good movie. You like the, I see, you like the movie, but, yeah. Well, I mean, I like, I like Michael Douglas as oh. an actor. Yeah, hmm. what, where was the confusion there? I mean, it'd be, you know. And that, is, is it common that people don't like Michael Douglas? Oh, this is written about you. I don't know. I, I can't say to the veracity of the claims. I wouldn't want to do that either. Dinotopia is indeed good rat. Dinotopia. I don't know that one. I don't either. Speaking of Dinotopia. art from controversial people, any thoughts on German dictator's paintings before he was a dictator? Also, hi, Frangi, and by rags. I, I mean, if we're talking about Hitler, I mean, he's a pretty talented artist. Um, I think I've seen him before. I can't remember think what I thought about him, but of course, uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like, can you separate the man from the art? It's like, oh, sure. <laughs> you, you give it your shot, you know, your best shot. The Austria joke from Dumb and Dumber hits hard. I haven't seen Dumb and Dumber in long enough to know what that joke uh, yeah, was. Yeah, I can't remember. Right. If Raid Shadow Legends got an arcane quality show, would y'all watch it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, if yeah, I'd watch if anything quality, was an arcane sure. quality, then if, yeah, if of piss and shit got an arcane quality show, I would watch. <laughs> like it's <laughs> it's uh it's easy. That's an easy win. Um, uh, what do you think the discourse around it would be like if if Raid Shadow Legends got that? That would probably be good for them. Actually, that might be like a good idea. Absolutely, that would really it would, uh, it would help, help their PR. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if, because the amount of money they fucking burn on, like, advertisements, I say burn, they get it back, obviously, otherwise they wouldn't do it, um, I imagine that they could possibly hire even the same companies, maybe, or, or, I was about to say, would they be able to offer more than Riot? Probably not. Um, but uh... then again, I, I don't want to say, because I actually have no idea what they're capable of, <laughs> like, in terms of how much money they can spend. They'd probably make a lot of money. Yeah. Um, basically, anti-capitalist, envious hack artists couldn't stand that Kincaid made bank on unassuming, non-pretentious works of art. I mean, there would have been some people, maybe, who had that point of view, but I can, I can understand, uh, the anger to some extent. If you spam a lot of the similar images in a row, and then find out that the guy, like, was pretty ruthless with it, um, you know, I can see a resentment building up, but ultimately, like, I can't. I just, I, I, I find it hard to be mad at him, I think. Um, I think, uh, just the art itself is, like, a, it just was getting really boring. That was, that was the main thing that it was doing for me. Yeah, and it's not even about, like, whether or not it challenges me on a philosophical level. It's just a matter of, um, my eyes are looking around to be interested, and I'm like, I already saw all that. I already saw all that. I already exactly. saw all that. Exactly. Okay. Which is interesting, because I feel like, from what I saw, those, like, videos and stuff, he's clearly capable of doing other things. I just never wanted to move too far away from uh, a particular mode, which is... Uh... Which, uh, I guess, isn't surprising if he was making hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah, yeah. Essentially doing a very... Well, and hey, maybe he really, really enjoyed making those images particularly, and it's like, all right, I'm not gonna... Maybe. Hold I, it I, I guess you, you wonder if you get bored, though, you know? 
maybe he'll be interested to talk to him about that. See what he says. Too late now, though. Um, wanted to promote the film essay channel Movie Wise. He's got a nice sense of humor. Talks a lot about classics and maturity in characters. Sweet, good stuff. I have not seen him myself. Uh, hi, lads. I feel inspired by rewatching some of your older episodes. Will you help fund all of my all female movie remake called Twelve Pissy Women? Oh no! Oh my goodness! You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's every show now, though. Though you do wonder if a film with that kind of, like, a controversial name came out, but it was incredibly well written. Like, I wonder what would happen. I, I guess know. it would be see You'd assume it's a comedy, wouldn't you? Twelve Pissy Women. Twelve Pissy Women, yeah. <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's what like, you call a Batman movie. It's like a know. super serious drama. Like, okay, fair enough. Uh, you guys will say fleems and tisms without restraint, yet kitsch is the cutoff point? Yes. Yes. Yep. Pretty clear. Because yeah. Fleem and Tism aren't pretentious. And they make sense. <laughs> the, the, the kiss. They kiss do make sense. They make sense to me. Mm-hmm. Is the Mona Lisa challenging? One could argue it's just a picture of a woman, but it's one of the most famous works of art there is. I don't... Uh, challenging? challenging? I, don't, I, I don't want to make challenging, like, the only aspect of what makes art good. I just feel like it's some things don't challenge me at all that I think are amazing, so... I like being challenged, yeah, I don't think though. it has to be mm -hmm. challenging. I don't think art has to be challenging. Because, like, if someone said, do you think, um, you know, like, why do you like Soma and God of War Ragnarok greatly as video game stories? I could probably reference Soma's very challenging. Ragnarok's not very challenging uh, well, in its I storytelling. Well, I guess the thing is, I mean, Mario is art, and if we're not talking about, you know, actual challenge presented in the gameplay, Mario isn't challenging at all. But, like, the idea that that would make it lesser, I just find absurd. Yeah, we have lots of different metrics for, like, the... I, I would say that comes under the umbrella of meaning at that point. Like, challenging can be one of the ways. Yeah, um, exactly. Meaning is a complicated thing. Because um, something that's inspiring like, doesn't necessarily challenge you. It could just... I, I, you know. I Again, I just... Uh, I find it strange that someone could look at something that is beautiful but not confronting... And consider that to be like lesser mm. as just sort of a, a, a matter of like as a, a kind of a rule as something that's common, inherent, just seems strange. Aye. The Marvel's an unbridled kitsch, also high rags, I'll ghoul. Hello. Uh, who knows um, what the I Marvel's mean, it's funny because, like. like I said, I'm never going to use the word kitsch again, but uh, we've talked before about how Marvel is pretty afraid of letting any particularly strong emotion sit with the viewer for too long. Yeah. So in a certain sense, you could say that, that uh, Marvel is falls under that category. Yeah, it, it's kind of... I don't want to say cowardly, but... Um, it, it's hard to describe like what I would call that. Well, that, it's, that not it's wanting rags, any... isn't it? Yeah, rags. Yeah, fair yes, there, there you go. <laughs> Kit -cha. I feel sort of thin, like jam spread across too much man. Billboy baggage, 1994. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> jam spread across too much jam man. <laughs> jam a man. That's jam funny. a man of fortune. <laughs> uh, to... Find a man of fortune and then just jam him up. It might take a lot of jam, especially if he's a very large fellow. <laughs> <laughs> just dunk him at that point. It's easier. Plus, he tends to, he'll probably tend to eat it. So you have to be quick with your. Gotta be quick, jamming. yeah, yeah. Gotta be quick. He's got that cartoon tongue that like slithers all around and gets it all up in one. one yeah, go. like Curds the Cowardly Dog. He can just mm -hmm. like just you know clean himself all up in one big swoop, like in the Tower of Doctors Lost with uh, candied plums. Of course, yeah, yeah. Uh, two girls, one poo. Hmm. I guess the other one didn't huh. need to go. The signatures on the wills look like the Theoden signature when he's possessed by Sauron. Lol. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fair, yeah, that does they did kinda of look like that. Uh this one's for you, Walt. Psh, also high rags. Hello to you. Rooster Teeth are removing Red vs. Blue and other shows from YouTube. I knew they were being tismy these past few years, but this just takes the cake. Oh, like entirely? I want people to like subscribe to their streaming service. Boo. Damn. Mm. <laughs> oh. Mm. Damn. Oh well. If Funko Pops were paintings. You know, is that what you're saying Kincaid is? <laughs> Funko Kincaid. Pops for paintings? That's interesting. Um, 
I, I don't know, well, but I see what you the mean. The unified nature that makes you almost disgusted to look at it because of that. I understand that aspect. But come on, Funko Pops just... Well, may maybe that's the key to understanding the people who hated Kincaid, actually. Funko Pops. Maybe that's it. Bringy, have you played Mark of the Ninja? If not, I recommend it. You can sneak in shadow and you can have a magic tattoo that slowly takes your sanity away. Uh, I have played Mark of the Ninja. That is a really cool uh, side-scrolling stealth game. Um, why have a fussy husky or a dopey boxer? Or would you rather? Fussy husky um, or dopey boxer? I... <sighs> Hmm. A fussy husky, I guess. Well, no. Well, maybe maybe it's too warm around here for too much of the year to have a husky. Maybe my my climate doesn't owe itself well. I don't actually know. I don't know um, much about I dog mean, ownership. Sorry. The thing is, it's pretty hot around. Like, there are plenty of huskies in Australia, even though it's really hot. Um, and in terms of the breed that I like more, I like uh, I like huskies. But maybe conscious of the weather, I might go with the boxer. But I, I definitely prefer huskies. They're like one of my favorite breeds of dog. They look I... very cool. Oh yeah, they're, they're awesome. one of the coolest looking dogs. Yeah, they're very approachably wolf-like in a way. That's Not the... more or less the category, like for me, my preference like for dog dogs are really bigger and they look like a wolf. <laughs> so yeah, th them, uh, Labradors, German Shepherds, uh, Kelpies, uh, what's what's the what's the the uh, border collie? Wait, that's the what's what's the uh, uh, lassie dog? What what breed is that? Is that's lassie collie, a right? golden retriever or a? I, I no, I don't. La, what is yeah? What is uh, a, a collie? That's what they are. But a collie, a, all right. A rough collie. Rough. Rough indeed. Um, yeah, as for me, I'd pretty much the same answer. I um, I think whether he would be suitable for a husky, but I kind of I'd, I'd be interested in having him either. If I was forced to, of course. Um, art efaps are like catnip to me. Keep up the good work. No problem. Yeah, you bet. We like art. I'm sure we'll talk about it for many years to come, until we finally put it, until we put an end to this and we finally solve it. Uh, does YMS not like as? I get it, but... Hey man, let people not like and like each other, I guess. I don't know. That's just the way the world works. Yeah. Uh, there was animation twit of a wholesome family eating McDonald's and some political brain rot victims literally said it's evil right-wing pedo propaganda. Uh, Dev made a, made a video on this. For those of you who don't know, check out Dev's channel, Short Fat Otaku. He made a video on it. Is it called The World is Weird? I can't remember Part what the name 7, of it. Part 7843. <laughs> Something like that. No, um, it's not a it's not a Twitch or it's not a TikTok reaction thing. It's oh, right, right, right. Video proper, yeah. Have you guys seen House of Usher yet? How does it compare to Flanagan's other work? Uh well he nailed the ending. I say nailed, I mean he didn't destroy it. You know what I mean? Like that's nailing yeah, it for him. Yeah. Um, there's some issues I take with bits and bobs of the writing, but I was very happy with it overall. I thought it was a neat story. Um, how does it compare? I didn't, uh, get as much out of it as I did from Bly. Um, but I'm quite fond of it, and I think it's leagues ahead of, like, a lot of TV shows that come out. And it's Absolutely. almost embarrassing to compare it to, like, Ahsoka or Loki. <laughs> it is embarrassing yeah. to compare them, yeah. Do you remember, like, the sequence in the first episode where they go from child to child to child and they're having a conversation with their significant other slash their career opportunities slash the bounty that's been placed slash their point of view on this entire court case? It's just, dare I say, spamming information at you. It's, like, setting up everything, going over dynamics, and it's just like, whoa, do you remember this? Do you remember getting, like, 11 out of 10 information per scene compared to 0 0.1 out of 10? It's just so much uh, more dense. Yeah. And you miss it. You just miss it. Oh, sweet crispy critters. Hope this IGN review doesn't have surprise cringe, though since it's Ahsoka, that can't be helped. I don't think that cringe is surprising in Ahsoka. 
I would also say that was by the cringe. That was an okay IGN video that we saw. It by was IGN okay standard, was by good. IGN standard. Yeah, by IGN standards, that was a seven out of ten. Yeah, I, uh, we agreed with most of it. I think it, there was some stuff yeah. she said that was weird, but you know, she said some weird bat shit stuff. But for the most part, pretty decently spot on with the show for the most part. Um, boom, ba -da boom. I love how this episode echoes back to the over criticism and how we should praise not necessarily original done well. That's a very interesting written sentence. Um, I'm trying to make Are sense of it. Are they trying to say that? Can you read that again? I love how this episode echoes back to the over criticism and how we should praise not necessarily original done well. Maybe, oh, ad adaptation maybe? Maybe. Not necessarily the original, but it's done well in and of itself. And if that's what you're trying to say, then I totally agree. Mm-hmm. Um, done well is kind of the big, you know, huge focus of those uh, you know, yeah. thoughts. If it's done well, then it's done well. And we can talk about adaptation stuff, you know, as its own separate conversation. Unless, as, you know, Fringy well knows, and I know from watching the Halo show, you can't just take shit from something and not know why it's there to be taken, you know, sort of. Just it's not just a buffet that you can choose this and that and this and that. And that. You have to think about it. You have to put some real thought into if you're going to deviate, you need to understand why the decisions were made in the first place and what material was supporting them so that you can create new material that fits. If you just pick and choose, you end up with something that's uh, broken. Yeah, let's, let's say you're going to, if you're going to the buffet where the sandwiches are made, right? And instead of getting like your bread, your meat, your cheese, your plants, that kind of thing, Instead, you just got like randomly like olives and shredded cheese and like just random stuff. And you don't know why it all comes together to make a sandwich. That's kind of how storytelling elements can be. Uh, have you guys seen the newest dev update from Riot? Arcane is now canon. Would love to see you guys react to the lore segment of the video. Seems like they subscribe to your philosophy on storytelling. Hmm. Oh, that, that um, I don't know anything about the canon of League of Legends, but I'm sure Mahler does, maybe. Doesn't sort of. surprise me at all that they would uh, rebuild around <laughs> I mean, Arcane, because Arcane... Yeah. yeah, lean heavily into the stuff that people love. Yeah, which is, by the good. way, just a really great uh, non-hypothetical to now have. The, the source material exists, they make an adaptation that is different, and League's better. <laughs> and then they basically reshape the source to... Um, to match this adaptation to the elation of the fans. That, that, that's like a, you know, that's got to count for something in the conversation about adaptation. Because, um, as far as I'm aware, some of the Marvel comics even have morphed around what happens in the films to the chagrin um, of Marvel fans. Um, yeah. And of course, it's like, well, so what's the key element then? Don't change source? It's like, no, actually, it's literally down to how good the writing is every time. That's always what it is. Uh, it's we, not your get out of jail free card because it takes work, but yeah. you can excuse a lot of stuff. And even excuse is a bit loaded, but you can get away with a lot of stuff if the writing is just good. Um, but yeah, uh, obviously we'll be there on the on day one for Arcane when it comes out, season two. Burn on the burn. But I'll have to check that out if they talk about their storytelling philosophy in that video. That sounds like fun. Anyway, uh, Muller, I watched The Prestige for the first time, and my god, a masterpiece. But why specifically, though, do you consider it, as you said, the greatest story ever told in a film? Spoilers. Oh, that's part one. Um, I don't, have I ever described it as the greatest story ever told? I know it's my favorite. Um, I've, I might have used those words before, but I feel like that's, uh, gotta be careful saying something like that, because that's, that's big flames. Because um, I'd be more inclined to say that the Lord of the Rings trilogy is the best story ever told in film. And you might be like, well, wait, why, why, why isn't that your favorite then? It's like, well, you choose these things differently. I think that the scope of Lord of the Rings and the coverage and then the impressive nature of a lot of the filmmaking elements would likely lift it differently. Not to say that Prestige doesn't have that as well. But like, why I think prestige is incredibly special is that it's an in, it's incredibly detailed and like layered story that comes in three pieces that move around and um a cut such in a specific way that they have like realizations that um are really important and ripple through each of the timelines or uh sections as you will 
So, like, in terms of how to split up a non-linear story, I think it's super impressive on that angle. Then there's the character work is fucking brilliant. The fact that this, like, you know, cataclysmic uh, series of events all comes from the fact that it's loads of misunderstandings, ego, and uh, interest in sort of being the best. I think it, like, appeals hardcore to fundamental hu nature of humanity that what what we're all here to do what we try to do and i like that the two characters almost have the exact same goal but for different reasons and different interests and then the duality aspect of the whole thing obviously um their personas as magicians versus the lives they live as men and how it like completely gets fucked up by all of their ambitions the uh the split between borden and well, other Borden, and uh, there's differences between them despite the fact that they're twins leads to one of them dying while the other one doesn't, like the ambition kills one and not the other. Um, then, you know, the, the, the pledge, the turn, the prestige, that thematically matches the way the story's even told, um, as well as, like, you know, the, the acts of discovering how the magic works in loads of parts of the film, as well as uh, the magic behind the, the, the filmmaking. And I think that it's really cool. They had like rock solid down to earth magic tricks that were being performed like in camera, so to speak. Like there's 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 obviously going to be special effects with like the Tesla stuff, but a lot of it is actual like quote unquote illusion magic that's in the film. And they show you how it's done and stuff. And then they have like commentary on what that means and what uh, it's like for a magician to work and what people are interested in. And I think it's representative of our interest in media a lot of the time. Like, the tricks behind it can sometimes ruin the interest in it. Um, this comes up with, like, discovering the history of a spooky monster or the the lore behind, like, w this could happen with, like, discovering how the Jedi came along. It's, like, maybe something we don't want to know. It helps uh, keep a, a sense of mystery or something. And as he says, when you, like, teach someone the trick, they, like, lose all interest in you. And that's something that Borden learns earlier on. There's, there's I could go on forever. Uh, the Prestige is an infinitely fascinating movie to me as well as uh, everything it's saying, what it's doing. And then I find it super impressive. It's just a fundamental sort of study on our interest in uh, making a difference, being appreciated. And as uh, Angie says before he dies, that he just wanted to see the look on their faces to convince people that the world isn't as simple and solid, and boring and mundane as you thought it was. Which is uh, really neat. I like The Prestige. I give it a thumbs up. Prestige is muy bueno. I don't know if anything else you guys want to say about it instead of just me. <laughs> no, I, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's fair enough. Carry on. I think it's good. Oh, I, I guess I'll just one, uh, one addition. Uh, I think that saying Lord of the Rings is, if someone said that was the greatest story in film, you know, it'd be hard to fault him because of its, you know, how good it is, and with all the stuff under its scope. You know, there's so much going on. A lot of good messages. A lot of great characters and places. You know, it's this excellent package of, you know, the cinematics and the music and the acting that it's just, uh, it's hard to beat. It's a really easy thing to point to, uh, for like an archetypal great story or an archetypical, wait, it's, it's a really easy, you know, <laughs> set of films to point to as, this is like what stories are and it's a really great one. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, not to be too like silly about it, but it's just good triumphing over evil by working together. So it pretty much achieves that one hundred percent. Several characters, you know, going on arcs, learning things about themselves and their place in the world, and coming to grow together, uh, bond, and then go on an adventure. Going a few layers deeper, I think that Lord of the Rings is one of the better examples of what it has to say and uh, you know show about the nature of redemption yeah it's got it's got some really great fundamental themes they're really they're really um it's not that they're common i don't think that's the right word it's that they're very universal yes camaraderie redemption um heroism bravery even addiction with uh golem to an extent mm, yeah exactly even even there too it's amazingly so. This is a this is a three parter on the prestige. It's amazingly well executed with the microcosmic intro. You lord, it's self compoundingly potent, like any great of storytelling. And the ideas it explores are so distilled and so complete. I tend to agree. I mm -hmm. 
Love that movie. But my question, other greats of cinema have these qualities too, so does it simply arithmetically inch out higher than all the other greats, or is there some unique transcendent thing that it does slash has? Oh, I would. why it's my favorite just appeals to me the most. Um, it, it gets really hard when you start to get to the best of the best in any given medium. Yeah. It's the reason why I often don't like having something that I just say is my number one, because it feels like it's more a collection of um, the best slash the things that appeal to me the most. I mean, for me, it's really simple. Sometimes I'll just go with whatever I realize over time is occupying my mind the most or had the most impact mm -hmm. on me. Simple as that. Like yeah. some of these things I'll be like, I wouldn't have said this, but I have to, because I know it's true, like, that this thing affected me the most. Yeah, um, exactly. So, yeah, Prestige is definitely up there, like, Soma is also up there, and, uh, you know, other other bits and bobs of media, like Buffy, where I'm just, like, it, made it ended up making me think the most, and it influences a lot of my choices in life, ultimately, so. That would be why it's my favorite. For example, if someone said, What's it? so you think that Prestige is better than No Country for Old Men? I'd be like, uh... uh Better is kind <laughs> like of a, it's Once a, we it's start getting into the, this territory, it gets complicated. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just tuned in to be greeted by. Why would we presume that the leprechaun's milk is green? <laughs> yeah, we're having an important. One must discussion. imagine the leprechaun's milk green. That's right. It's philosophical. Uh, does she mean that a viewer can approach a show without extensive knowledge of what comes before? Talking about the IGN review. Um. I'm not sure exactly, because I can't remember, but, uh, like I said, mostly solid videos, okay. In fact, I think it's we should fine. promote her in, in IGN, because she, 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 <laughs> she thinks she's slightly freer than them. IGN, yeah, for an I especially compared to how well uh, Ahsoka was reviewed mm -hmm. by, uh, by IGN, it's kind of funny. It's so funny, you know, the show was reviewed, what was the overall, an 8 out of 10, several episodes got a 9. And yeah. you put out a video that's very on point about how flawed <laughs> uh, Ahsoka and the finale was. It the just, finale that was rated a 9 out of 10. It just feels like it captures uh, what we've been saying about like aggregate review sites. Or, or not even aggregate, just... I don't want to say the word shell, but you know what I mean. Like, sites uh, that come across... I just say, like, traditional mainstream like media websites like IGN or GameSpot or... The, the only caveat I want to add is just ones that we expect to be bad at their job, like, as opposed to... Because <laughs> yeah. I don't want to say that for all of them. Maybe there's some out there that have no, a better no, reputation. No, no, no. But IGN, you know. IGN is a particularly clownish... Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it is like peak video game journalism website, isn't it? I mean, it's the IGN of video games. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, the fact... yeah. What's the meme? Can't spell ignorant without IGN. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Classic. <laughs> Classic. Fun fact, relevant to current events, Neil Druckmann said the SCAR WLF conflict in Las Vegas 2 was supposed to represent Israel Pal- Please, no. Just- Yeah, just, sure. Just, just no. No, thank you. Neil, stop it. Sit down. You know, you, you still have time to decanonize the Las Vegas 2. You can still do it. Ooh, Any day. Do it. Any you day. Work. They were working on that factions multiplayer mode for like three, four years, and now that's basically all but dead. Mm. And what have they got to show for it? You know, The Last of Us 2 is three years old at this point. Ugh. By now, you would be expecting to find out what their next video game is. And like, and if, have it's it be actually, well underway, yeah. if it's actually The Last of Us 3, that would blow my fucking mind. I would be, I would be shocked. Well, hey, and yet, it's pretty bold as a decision. <laughs> I that. say it's incredibly bold to continue. I wouldn't be able something. to resist playing it, honestly. I'd be like, holy oh, I mean, shit, what I'd did you do? I'd be playing it out of morbid curiosity, but the, the part of me... I'd be certainly like, curious, absolutely. I guess the problem at this point is, you know, when it's like, hey, Fringy, do you like Naughty Dog? I don't know if I can mm. even say yeah anymore. Um, I'd say yes if you were speaking about Naughty Dog up until a point. Um, yeah. You know, basically up until and including Uncharted 4, yeah. But now, no. And I really, 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 really do not want them to go near their old stuff. I don't want them to make another Uncharted. I sure as hell don't want them to try Jack and Daxter again. No way. Just let it yeah. be in that, in that wonderful realm that was the early to mid-2000s. Um, does anyone wonder what Ahsoka even means by I know? Now, for context, they're talking about when uh, Sabine says sorry in reference to giving up the map to get to Ezra. 
And Ahsoka responds, I know. So I'm going to be 100% um... generous and say <laughs> that what we're supposed to draw from that is Ahsoka recognizes she, that she knows she did the thing wrong, but that she also did it to get to Ezra. And that that's not... Remember, Ahsoka said something like it was fate that that decision was made or some bullshit. Oh, um, I think that was... Um, She said she was fated to make that choice, but she said it in a way that was more pessimistic, whereas uh, good old Hu Yang was trying to spin it in a more positive way, that that was the only choice she could make. Yeah, well, it, which, that's kind of where I was going to go with that. Thing, like, isn't it? That's exactly the same thing. I think we're supposed she to was... assume Ahsoka understands why she made the choice and that she knows that Sabine knows that she probably shouldn't have, but that she was always gonna because it was in favor of Ezra. And, that that's, and then, of course, you know, you know, tethered into her continued statements. Doesn't matter. I got you back, Sabine. Because I um, stick with you, much like my master should have stuck with me. Although, no, she said Anakin I, did stick with her, right? <laughs> even though he absolutely did not. Didn't. Yeah, that's um, just bullshit. I mean, he tried to kill her. And uh, yeah, um, I, I still think that analysis is relatively generous, and that there should have been way more flesh on all of that. That's uh, ridiculously I mean, thin. <laughs> that was all that they had for those characters. Yep, that was the conflict episodes. they could have done something with, and we got about five lines. Fall of the House of Usher was eight episodes. The episodes were longer, but there's no reason that the Ahsoka episodes, they're not bound by the restrictions of network television. I felt like those episodes even halfway through episode one, we'd already passed the total information provided by uh, Ahsoka season one. Yeah. Without, like, any, yeah. without any hyperbole, honestly, one season of, uh, one episode of Fall of the House of Usher is equivalent to the entire season's worth of uh, story in Ahsoka. I said half. Not exaggerating. Oh, <laughs> I thought you said that half was like equivalent to several. If you said no, whole bit, season. Yeah. So and and to sound less hyperbolic, I guess, because I know a lot of people would be like, ah, yeah, very funny. So take the um the first scene where they're like eating as a family, I think, or they've met up. They're having cake, right? And they're talking about their um the pim forms. Um, there's an exchange. I think they're cutting the cake, and uh, Roderick says, uh, Frederick marrying this woman is the one thing you didn't fuck up. Um, that line alone is already huge in terms of like, wow, that he's willing to say that in front of all of them, that he considers Frederick a complete fuck up, that this girl is someone he appreciates mainly because she's able to decorate cakes well. Like, I wonder how well, is that something he didn't know? Or is that something, does he care? I don't know. And I guess he's probably trying to sell it more so as a joke, but everyone else enjoys like the nature of it being like that. And then Frederick says, oh, well, I guess we have that in common. Uh, sort of, you know, raising a glass to... Um, Roderick's new wife, and this is all information you have within the, the scene itself, who has looked awkward throughout the whole thing, and is just trying to get along with his kids, because she's their stepmom, technically, even though she, obviously, I think she's younger than several of them, um, and is not being accepted by the family, and has already commented earlier that Frederick is only theoretically nice to her to try and impress the dad, because the dad obviously doesn't have infinite time left, and they're all vying for his fortune, inheritance that's the a lot of the comparisons to succession that are made and then um i think it cuts to um oh, i can't remember if it was camille or the eldest daughter but i think she says oh for fuck's sake and uh then it cuts to the 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 new mother of the family technically who's just starts drinking wine because the compliment from frederick has now caused everyone to think about how she is their mum like, and, and nobody likes her there and considers her like an addition that's been added because Roderick is interested in her, which we discover is partly related to the fact that she is a big consumer of his drugs and so a great advocate for the fact that they're safe and healthy, right? Like, she takes more of a dose than anyone else typically does. Uh, and what I'm getting at is, like, there's all of this in, like, two, three lines. How long does it take to get that kind of content in Ahsoka? Like, it's absurd. It's remarkable. Um, it's astounding how lacking in story Ahsoka is compared to like a real television show. This is what I mean. Like, this is why my videos TV are so show. fucking long with the stuff that I cover that I really like because like it's, it's easy to extend it as well. Like we've done this with EFAB episodes, but like when you don't like it, you can talk about not only what they miss but all of like the ways that the line itself is so pathetic compared to what it could have been. How it contradicts everything that came before it, like. It's such an interesting scale of how much you can achieve with just a line of dialogue. And yeah, when we were watching Usher, I was just like, ah, back to TV, back to actually watching like TV. Like actual stories, actual characters. 
where everything it's they say really nice. matters, has weight, decides like things in future. It's like, ah. Uh. Um. Hey, Massive. Thoughts on the new Spider-Man games? I've been replaying them in anticipation for the new game, and I really enjoy the gameplay. I've not played uh, it. I'm the only one who's played uh, Spider-Man, right? I believe so. I think so. I have not played it. Uh, I like it. It's a fun game. Uh, it's got fun combat. It's uh, the traversals, um, which uh, feels like a thing that... Uh, it feels like it sort of goes up and down in terms of games recognizing how important it is to make moving from one place to the other fun in like an open world game. Something Insomniac was... Uh, though, maybe this is a hot take. I think Sunset Overdrive has a better traversal than, uh, than Spider-Man PS4. That, ge that game was really... Damn, that game is that, that game was like is early really Xbox underrated. One, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that was uh within the first year. That's uh I got that with my Xbox One bundled with it. Um that game is really good. If you're looking for a game that's got really fun traversal mixed, like with the combat integrated into the movement, really colorful. Um, like Sunset Overdrive is a really great game. It's uh it's kind of a shame that basically nobody played it, but it was kind of uh a victim of the the early era of the Xbox One when for good reason everybody was pretty yeah uh, people were like pretty, pretty pissed off with Xbox and resistant to uh to that brand. Um but I guess to bring it back to Spider-Man PS4, yeah it's it's a fun like open world uh game Arkham S combat, but uh it, it like it integrating verticality and the movement into the combat as well with the gadgets. It's a fun game. Yeah, I like it. I'm looking forward to playing the uh the new one. Uh, I really enjoy the gameplay of both. The story in the first game is pretty solid, but the story in Spider-Man Miles Morales is packed with issues. World building, plot, and characters are all quite flawed. Thoughts? Uh, well, so I didn't play Miles Morales, so I can't speak to that one. And I haven't played the first game since it came out, so I don't really remember much of the story. I remember that there were good beats in it, though. Mm -hmm. uh, but as for, like, the broad plot, yeah, I can't really speak to it. Uh, also, High Rags, Mubles, and Frong. Hi. Hi. Hey. Uh, Jeff Bridges is on record as having a low opinion of Iron Man and realized he could phone it in, and even then he injected it with some personality. I was going to say, I love Obadiah Stane. The, the performance is really strong, so if that was him phoning it in, I guess that just means that he's a really well, fucking good actor. Well, Jeff Bridges is, uh, I don't know if I've ever been unhappy with a Jeff Bridges performance. Yep, always bought it, and uh, I bought him in that. But to be fair, like it's, it's well known, Obadiah Stane is not particularly well realized by the time you get to the end of the film uh, as a character no, he kind of starts to fall apart by the end uh, a shilling for the Disney Star Wars de decay meter oh yeah I guess so mm. uh, why there was no comment showcase in Ahsoka minis oh yeah I did answer this the, uh, they they did not get out on the timeline that me and Fringy would have preferred to get and that was with both of us working on it without comment showcase uh so, you know, we, we're trying to find ways of getting this stuff done a little bit faster, and that's just how it worked. But of course, uh, I guess that just means it goes back to being a comment section in general, which is still, you know, there for you guys yeah. to interact and appreciate. Uh, yeah, don't most worry. comment sections are just comment sections. So, we read yeah. them still here and there and incorporate a lot of the insights into future episodes and stuff. Don't you fret. Uh, the Empire is never more alive than when we sleep. Is that is that a quote from Andor? I could buy that. I it think is. it was a quote from Andor. It rings a bell. Uh, don't let them lock your balls, Morley. We appreciate all the hard work. Keep it up and water your jebs. Will do. Always water your jebs. And uh, that's it. That's the last message. So oh, wow. Thank you very much, everybody, for the kind messages, kind donations, and uh, hope you enjoyed that episode of EFAP and this catch-up. There's still more for us to record, so you'll get more in future. Don't you worry. Um, but for now, thank you so much, and uh, I guess goodbye. Yeah, goodbye, everybody. See ya.